Welcome back. You are listening to Nate the Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, be sure to do so and click that notification bell so that you are alerted each time a new episode is uploaded. And I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer. Hey, what's up, Nate? Great to be here. Thanks for having me on as always. And today is an exciting day. It is the conclusion of Nintendo's E3 Direct presentation, and we are going to go over what Nintendo showed at this year's E3, as well as our thoughts and general feel of what Nintendo had to showcase for us earlier today. And we're going to start with what game was your big moment for this Direct MVG? Well, I mean, Nate, we've been talking about Metroid for a while. You know, we we said that Metroid would make an appearance at E3. We just didn't really know what it would entail, whether we would finally get to see Metroid Prime 4 or maybe the Metroid Prime trilogy. I think in the last month or so, we kind of felt like Metroid Prime wasn't going to show at E3. But there's also the talk about 2D Metroid, which we have covered on the show before, and we did predict last week that would be at E3 and for me Metroid Dread was the big surprise I mean even though we felt pretty confident that Metroid 2D Metroid would be at E3 sometimes you just wondered is this thing even real anymore does it you know it's been such a long time since we've seen anything from Metroid you just kind of wonder does Nintendo even like acknowledge this franchise anymore so for me, Metroid Dread was probably the big surprise and the big announcement of the show. Um, I liked what I saw. I thought it was very intriguing. I liked the 2D graphic style. And that's another part that, you know, as as an old school Metroid fan, I love the pixel artwork of the original Metroids. So this one was, um, it looked good, you know, it looked good and it felt good. Um, so I was probably the most excited about Metroid. I think... I would agree with Metroid Dread, but for the sake of the discussion and being different, I'm going to go with Advanced Wars. Ooh. This, this was definitely a surprise announcement. It felt as though it really came out of nowhere with Advanced Wars 1 and 2 Reboot Camp. And these were two of my favorite games back on the Game Boy Advance. Yeah. And to see them be remade for the modern consoles was you know, just a welcome, very welcome surprise. And you know, I'm a little mixed on the visual style of the game right now. But the fact that it is coming out later this year before the before you know the holiday season concludes, I believe it is a December 3rd release date, just excites me. I yeah. can't wait to revisit these games and see how much I remember of these map layouts and how I can approach my combat situations in the game. And you know, this was a game that came out, you know, 15 plus years ago. So there's gonna be a lot of newcomers to see what the Advanced War series is all about. And that's exciting that people are going to be able to actually be reintroduced to what used to be a popular and well-regarded franchise for the Nintendo brand. And, you know, it's exciting to see that return. But yeah, Metroid Dread, I would say, was definitely probably the game of show as far as, you know, the Nintendo Direct goes in terms of 2021 releases. Yep. It's the reference, or actually naming it Metroid Dread, it's just a great callback to something that I believe it's been 16 years mm -hmm. since Metroid Dread was mentioned in the previous Metroid games. And it's funny because at the time and they said com completion of Metroid Dread or it's nearing completion of Metroid Dread. And that's what sparked so many rumors at the time of, oh, it's going to be a brand new 2D Metroid game way back for, you know, like the DS era. Yeah. And then just nothing happened. And what we learned today is the idea of Metroid Dread has actually been in the minds of Nintendo for the last 15 plus years. So this has definitely been a game that's been in the works for a long time, at least conceptually. Yeah. For the better part of, you know, well over a decade and a half. And I got to say, Mercury Steam has put a lot of my fears to rest. I think the visual style that's on display here is, you know, breathtaking. Yeah. I love the artistic direction they're taking with Metroid Dread. I love how the the suit, the fusion suit looks on Samus. And to see the story continue, then we have the Emmy enemies and it brings back vivid memories of Metroid Fusion with was it the S S A X? Yep. 
the rogue Sam Metroid. Just, yeah. yeah, just hunting you. Or even Nemesis from like the Resident Evil games with yeah. this constant dread, which is likely, you know, why the title is called what it is, of being hunted and pursued. This has, it feels as though it's going to have some sort of horror type elements. Yep. And, you know, I can't wait to pick up this game when it comes out on October 8th. It's been a long time since we've had a 2D Metroid game dating back to Metroid Fusion 19 years ago. So it feels like a good time to have a brand new 2D Metroid game. And it looks like Mercury Steam has absolutely nailed not only the visual direction, but also audio. Yeah, absolutely. Gameplay direction. Yeah. Look, man, I, I'm really hyped about this. And you know what's funny is they talked about Metroid Prime 4 for a brief moment. And they're like, we know you're excited about Metroid Prime 4, but that but now check out this. You know, so like they they barely acknowledge Metroid Prime 4 is even a thing right now. I mean, obviously it's it's still a thing, but what did you think about that like Metroid Prime 4 and then quick pivot into the 2D? Did you think they they handled that well, or do you think maybe they could have talked a little more about what was happening with Metroid Prime 4. It felt like a moment of obligation that they want to talk about this brand new 2D Metroid. And they're like, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. That's Metroid Prime 4. We have to give some sort of update, even if it is just for fanfare of, yes, we're hard at work on that title that we introduced to you, you know, two years ago that was rebooted by Retro. And the fact that they couldn't even come up with just some concept art or a new logo or even just a still image of a work in progress suggests to me this game is still a long, long ways off. Yeah. And I'm not expecting a meaningful update on Metroid Prime 4 until maybe 2022. Yeah. Seems like it. And I mean, I think that's fine. At least they did communicate some form of an update. It was basically inconsequential at the end. We know you're hard at work on the game. This really isn't, this, is, this doesn't amount to anything. It was just mostly to give some reassurance that the title is still in active development. They're making progress. But with the pandemic and everything that's happened over the course of the last you know 18 plus months, I'm sure progress has been halted considerably. And... You know, when we do see the game, be it next year, I'm sure it's going to, you know, it will look yeah fairly impressive. I, I like, I'm just waiting for that meaningful update where we have more information on the concept and the approach to Metroid Prime 4, what direction they're taking with that particular brand of Metroid game. Because with Metroid Dread, you know, it's staying true to the 2D formula. It's introducing some new ideas, but... I'd say Metroid Prime 4 is probably going to be the title that we see more new concepts introduced. Yep. And that's going to be the one that's more revolutionary in approach. So, you know, take your time with it. And when you're ready to introduce it, bring it to us. Yeah. But it feels as though it, they just wanted to acknowledge it, give us a quick update. But their focus was let's have let Metroid Prime Dread or Metroid Dread. This is its moment. Let's not take away from it. Yeah. I agree. And and you're right. I mean, Metroid Prime 4 will have its time in the sun probably next year. Um, but you're right. I this is all about 2D Metroid. And yeah, I mean, I um I'm very, very excited about it. I think it's what the fans want. And hopefully they can, you know, they can they can sell a lot of units on this. It's very, very difficult to say how this is gonna go sales wise, but I think it it is geared up for, you know, probably the best selling Metroid game. Um, hopefully that will be the case, but we'll see how it plays out. Otherwise, I'm I'm very hyped about it. Um, easily the best announcement of the direct for me. Now, was there any big surprise? It doesn't necessarily have to be good. Yeah, it can also it can also be bad. But what would you say was the big surprise for you well, from this Nintendo direct? You mentioned Advance Wars, and that was the big surprise to me because that's that's something that that's another franchise that I, I'd love to see on the Switch, and and it was announced and. Honestly, I mean, this is not anything that that I've it's even been on my radar. We've never even talked about this other than just, you know, people fanboying asking for the game on the Switch and when they announced it, that was a pretty big announcement for me. Um but I will say Nate and this is just me. Um I'm nitpicking a bit, but I wasn't big on the graphical style of that game. Um there was just something missing from those 3D models that just made me think 
I wish they would spend more time, you know, touching that game up. And look, this they may well do that before the game comes out. It's coming out later on this year, of course. Um, but even still, I mean, it's Advanced Wars. And if the the game engine running underneath is the same as you know what we what we've seen, um, that's good enough for me. So I, I think for me, Advanced Wars was probably that surprise game. The other one, um, I know I'm cheating because I'm, I'm talking about two games, um, the the Mario Party game as well. That was also a surprise, especially considering Mario Party has had a bit of a weird and interesting time on the Switch. We had the Mario Party game that got no updates at all. And then just recently we got a multiplayer patch for it. It seems like Mario Party was getting some love and all of a sudden out of nowhere, we're getting this new Mario Party game with a hundred mini games, you know, from the, I guess, from all the previous games in one big bundle. I think for me, that was probably the, the biggest surprise. How about you? Um, You know, before I get to my biggest surprise, I'm going to also touch on the Advanced Wars visual aspect and I can see where you're coming from with it. Mm -hmm. There is a certain aspect of it that almost looks too clean. Yeah. And I would have liked a slightly dirtier, maybe more pixelated look that paid tribute to the Game Boy Advance originals in a way. Right. It's not to a point where I look at it, I'm like, oh, this completely turns me off from the game. Definitely not. But it reminds me, it reminds me of Tiny Metal a little bit. And that was a that was an Advanced War style game that came out on the Switch and other platforms several years ago. Yeah. It just has that clean sheen to it where and maybe like nostalgia talking, because I remember the Game Boy Advance game so fondly. But I would have just liked a little pixelated look, a little grit. Yeah. I mean, it's a war game. I understand it's supposed to be lighthearted and fun and it can appeal to children and stuff. I just I like that dirty factor that the pixel graphics allowed for. And, you know, this game is still several months away from release. It comes out in December. Maybe they can tune that visual style a little more based on some feedback that they're seeing on Twitter or forums or Reddit today or even YouTube Mm -hmm. and just a little more grit. And I think they could really help there. But it does look a little too clean. Yeah. But I'm still excited for the release and, you know, I will buy it. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Advance Wars was meant for the Switch. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, very excited about it. Um, visual style is not my favorite, but it's not going to detract from from me picking up the game and playing it because the Advance Wars games are, are, are top tier. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. So I'd say my biggest surprise, and it's in the form of disappointment, mm. is how Nintendo is handling the Zelda 35th anniversary. Ooh, there's a lot to unpack here. There is a lot to unpack here. And I mean, we Nintendo ended their direct with basically a tribute to Zelda. And this is where we saw a brand new trailer for Skyward Sword. We saw some DLC for Age of Calamity. They confirmed that there will be no other software releases in the anniversary year. So that's from now until the conclusion at the end of March of 2022 and then they introduced the zelda game and watch which has zelda 1 2 link's awakening and i believe it was what link ball Mm -hmm. yeah and you know that's oh vermin starring link as a playable character has the digital clock so it's very similar to what we got with the mario 35th game and watch and that was it yeah it felt as though Nintendo really, they're not celebrating Zelda in a meaningful way. And I, it's not that it's a huge disappointment. This is still quality stuff for fans of the franchise. And, you know, Twilight Princess and Wind Waker will still come to Switch. It's just clear now that it's not going to happen within the 35th anniversary fiscal year that's coming up over the stretch of the several months. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they could come out next year. But, and this is getting ahead of myself a little bit. If I take the words from Anuma literal of no other software releases planned for the 35th anniversary, that suggests Breath of the Wild 2, which was dated for 2022, is not coming out before the conclusion of the current fiscal year. And that we are potentially looking at a deeper 2022 release, such as summer, holiday, even 
the possibility, yeah. and I hate to put this out in the universe, of 2023, because their words were specific. Beyond just saying no other software releases for the 35th anniversary, they also said Breath of the Wild 2 is aiming for 2022. Yeah, that's that that message or that wording is is very particular, isn't it? It's yeah. We want to get it out this year, but there's no. Oh, sorry, we want we want to get it out next year, but there's no guarantees that we will. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's very open as to what is the release window going to be for this title. Like, I'm glad they finally slapped a release year on it. We had a lot of people expecting 2021 up till this morning as you know that possibility because nintendo hadn't dated a holiday lineup yet right and now that we know it's 2022 it's just going to be a matter of when in 2022 if it remains on track for 2022 and you know that's something we're going to learn in the months to come but i'd say that was definitely my biggest surprise is just how nintendo's handling the zelda 35th anniversary it feels as though they could have done something a lot more grand with it and you know maybe if breath of the wild 2 is a second half of 2022 release they're holding twilight princess and wind waker hd to kind of fill that role in the first half of 2022 but after the conclusion of the fiscal year so i'm talking you know april through july yeah kind of kind of placing them where skyward sword is this summer but for 2022 they could have done that because you know this is how fluid this industry is and we don't know how much COVID has impacted the development of Breath of the Wild 2, but considering the game was introduced to us back at E3 2019, and this is the first meaningful update we've gotten in two years, I'd say COVID's impact was pretty substantial. And the fact that their wording is still targeting or aiming for 2022, they probably had this game basically on full pause yeah. for, I'd say, three to six months which it takes a long time to make up that type of development ground. So that was my biggest surprise from Nintendo's Direct. And I don't think I went in with high, overly high expectation. I'd say we both came in with reasonably grounded expectation. It just felt like, hey, we could look to Mario's 35th anniversary just as a reference. We had 3D World with Bowser's Fury. An exciting release. Yes, it's a port, but it had a brand new, whole separate campaign. We then had the 3D All Stars collection. Then had Mario Game and Watch. Then you had a lot of merchandise from various partners. I don't think expecting that from the Zelda franchise was too much, and we're actually getting less. One thing that is really apparent is even though last year was COVID, the effects of of last year are being felt this year, and that. That couldn't be more apparent than than this Zelda anniversary stuff, right? Um, and we've also seen it with Sony, you know, with with their games, with with the delays that they've put on some of their games in recent times. We've also seen it from Microsoft. I mean, the Microsoft showcase was was excellent, but it also outlined most of the games that were coming out next year or beyond. It's no secret that you know COVID really has had an impact on the industry and. I think in Japan, probably even worse than it has, you know, in the US, um, they've really, you know, suffered the effects of of COVID. Plus, infrastructure wise, I don't know if they were as anywhere near as equipped to, you know, pivot to working from home schedule as as what we've had here in the US. And I think you're right, Nate. I think there has there was, you know, a period of time, you know, three, four months where nothing was being worked on. Um and ultimately, you know, it's it's been a very difficult road for them. I mean, a Zelda game takes many, many years as it is. You know, we're always waiting around for the next one. And then you add this into the mix. Um, it really just makes things a lot more complicated. Um, look, I think the trailer for well, what we saw for Breath of the Wild 2 was, was fine, right? Like, it was an update, but... You're right. It wasn't necessarily anything meaningful other than, you know, they put 2022 on the end, which, by the way, if you listen to last week's show when we predicted, that's what I said they were going to do. I didn't think that they were going to lock down a a month because I didn't think they were, they necessarily knew 
when the game would be coming. So you're right. There is a good chance that it falls out of next year. You know, um, it could be 2023. It, it's, it's something that I think Nintendo knew that they had to give an update on. And E3 is the right venue for, but it also does illustrate just how far away this game is to coming out. Um, Am I disappointed with with what they showed? No, I, I'm not necessarily disappointed. Um, but what I am a little disappointed about is, like what you mentioned, is that the Zelda anniversary doesn't seem like it's getting anywhere near the love that we thought it would. You know, um, all we're getting is really a Game and Watch and Skyward Sword HD, which quite rightly, I mean, that almost falls outside the anniversary window anyway. But let's 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 include it, you know, for argument's sake. And then you have Breath of the Wild. Um, now, look, uh, there, there may be, well, there probably will be another direct later on this year. We'll say September for argument's sake that we'll see another Nintendo direct announcement. Um, but I mean, if Anumasan's words are to be believed, and that's really all we have to go on, we may not see anything else from Zelda, and that is a little disappointing, you know, as as a Zelda fan. I mean, we're expecting at least something else, you know, uh, uh, something else to be announced, whether it was uh, Twilight Princess, Wind Waker, or maybe some edition of N64 games, or even, you know, some some of the older releases um, on the Nintendo Switch Online. We didn't get any of that. And um, I think really that was um, pretty, it was a miss. You know, I, I feel like they should have come to this direct with more. But I also feel like, yeah, they they don't have the capacity to do so. And it, and it's been really apparent with the absence of, you know, of those things. So um, I agree with you. I think the Zelda stuff that we saw at the Direct, even though we did get the Breath of the Wild 2 update, we got a new trailer. We got to see some cool mechanics of the game. We got to see more of it. It looks good. But yeah, um, it, it's one of those things where it's like, we're not going to see anything about Breath of the Wild 2, probably at least for another year. Um, you know, hopefully it does come out next year, but you're right, Nate. I mean, you know, there's a good chance that it could just fall out of 2022 very easily. Yeah, I mean, like the trailer that they had on display for Breath of the Wild 2, it looks good. The game visually looks very appealing, and they introduced some new concepts and mechanics that Link is going to have available to him. And I would say it made it very clear why we're having Skyward Sword released this summer because Breath of the Wild 2 takes place, at least based on this trailer, a certain aspect of the game takes place in the sky. You have sky islands and everything. So it looks as though it is borrowing a lot of ideas or gameplay elements from Skyward Sword. So it makes sense why we're getting Skyward Sword, because if you are going to take inspiration from that title moving forward with Breath of the Wild 2, you definitely want people to have that reference level available to them. And like I said, the trailer looks spectacular. Based on what we saw on the trailer, it does appear that this is this is a game that is probably at least a year off. Yeah. And, you know, that's OK. I think this was the time and place that Nintendo had to give an update on Breath of the Wild 2. Had there been no presence of Breath of the Wild 2 in this particular Direct, Ooh. you would have had a lot of angry Nintendo fans saying, yeah. what is going on with this game? Why can't they communicate some sort of update to us? So you had to drop a trailer today. You had to give us an update just to alleviate some of those concerns. You put that 2022 release date on it. Yes, you follow it up with the phrasing of aim for 2022, but at least... So we have an idea. We now have a window of expectation for this product because up until today, we had no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All we could really base it on was, you know, information that we had been hearing of a 2022 release date or just the expectation of they announced this game two years ago. A holiday 2021 release date makes sense based on that fact. But now we have the idea. It's 2022, hopefully. And we have a better idea of how they are evolving the gameplay aspect over Breath of the Wild. And, you know, there's clearly a lot to learn about this title still. We know we're going to have an aspect in the sky. Are we still going to have act full access to what we had in Breath of the Wild 1 in terms of ground Hyrule? 
or is the majority of the game going to take place in the sky? That's something we'll learn right. in the future when we get another meaningful update. And th- there's, the game doesn't even have a title yet because they, they yeah. refer to it as the <laughs> sequel to Breath of the Wild. There's no, yes. there's, there's not even titled yet. <laughs> You know, that's also a little surprising that they haven't af- given it an official name. It is, isn't it? Like, yeah. When you re- when you think of that, it's like we still don't know the name of this game. Maybe when it comes out, it really is just called Breath of the Wild Part Two. Yeah, it could be. That'd be pretty funny, actually, if they do that. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about the game and watch announcement? I mean. Do you think it's their way of basically saying, yeah, we know you love Zelda, so we're going to just slap four games onto this thing so you can enjoy it? To me, even with the Mario game and watch, it's it just feels, here's a collector's item. Yeah. We know we're going to sell X amount just for collection's sake. I'm really curious how many people bought the Mario game and watch and actually opened it and played Mario Brothers on the game and watch system itself, or maybe use it as a clock on Mm -hmm. their desk. But it just feels like they know you slap that 35th anniversary brand on it. It's a collector's item. It's going to sell well. And that's why they do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think the collection of software on it is pretty neat. They acknowledge the series roots with the first two games. They go with Link's Awakening as, you know, the original Game Boy game. And then you put in vermin, you have the clock feature and all that. It's a nice little collector's item. Um, I just don't see anyone actually buying this to play these games. If you really want to play either NES Zelda game, you can just do so on Nintendo Switch Online for your Switch. Or, you know, you're playing it on your Wii or your Wii U. Mm -hmm. And with Link's Awakening, you can play that brand new remake on the switch as well so it's smart business just to craft this as a collector's item yeah. and it will sell well for that reason alone but you know it's it's not an excitement i to be like yeah this is awesome it's just neat yeah I, I agree i mean look zelda was you know i think if there was any disappointment for me out of this direct because i i enjoyed the direct a lot um, I think Zelda needed more in in the show. Now, maybe you know our expectations were too high. Um, you know, going into this, I, I'm not sure, but I do feel like they could have shown us something else from Zelda. I think if they sh- had shown us either Twilight Princess or Wind Waker HD, that would have been enough for me to say, okay, yep, I, I, I'm. I get it. You know, um, I just feel like the absence of something else really, I won't say hurt, hurt the direct because I don't think it did, but it wasn't as, I guess, you know, as impactful as what it should have been. Yeah. I think that was the big thing is that when you factor in like the GameStop poster, right. And everyone's saying, well, the 35th anniversary is kicking off this week. And the 35th anniversary is just Age of Calamity DLC will include Skyward Sword and a Game and Watch. It's kind of like, wait, yeah, that's really just it. That's it. And yeah. like, I don't, I don't believe going in with the expectation of having like a Wind Waker and Twilight Princess bundle available this year or even early next year was unreasonable. We saw Nintendo do it with 3D All Stars with. Mario 64, Sunshine and Galaxy. So why would it be unrealistic for them to do the same right. with Zelda? I right. think that was a very basic expectation to hold. And numerous individuals have gone to Twitter over the course of the day and say, be patient, it's still coming. It's right. just not going to be part of the 35th anniversary. And you know the release dates could have changed. They could have shifted. Like Those products will come. And it's just kind of baffling as to why are they not part of the 35th anniversary? You have January through March, which clearly is not going to be occupied by Breath of the Wild 2. And it feels like a quick fill release. Now, maybe the wording of the 35th could still be open to interpretation. And, you know, these games do release in Q4 of Nintendo's fiscal year somehow. But, you know, right now we have to operate under the idea that the word is gospel and that that won't be the case. But 
it just does feel a little underwhelming. And it could be a factor of COVID that everything got pushed back and they had to rearrange their intents and how they were approaching this 35th anniversary. So, you know, I can't be too upset due to the current environment of the world, but it does feel as though the 35th is just being treated as an afterthought. And I don't think anyone expected that to be the case with Zelda. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you, uh, you really touched on a lot of interesting points there. Um, I, I was disappointed, you know, all said and done, but very happy to see Breath of the Wild 2, uh, you know, new, new footage of that game. Man, I want to play it. You know, it looks great. Um, I'm, I'm really psyched about it, but we're just going to have to wait. You know, we could be in, could be a year, could be 18 months. We don't know, but it's mm-hmm. what we do know is it's still a long way away. Yes, that's, that is very true. And now we're going to we'll do a quick walkthrough of the Direct itself, and we'll touch on some of the key points that we want to talk about with the games that were on display. And the first one on the list is Metroid Dread. We already kind of talked about this earlier, and we're both very excited for this release. Mercury Steam seems as though they may have hit a home run with their original take on the Metroid franchise, obviously with input and oversight from Nintendo. But visual style, audio, everything looks fantastic. It releases on October 8th. There will also be a Metroid Dread Special Edition that comes with the game, a steelbook, a 190-page 2D Metroid franchise art book, and five cards that feature the box art from (laughs) all the games in the five-part saga. And, you know, depending on the price, I will probably look to secure a pre-order of that game. I'm going to get that for sure. We then had a brand new announcement from Nintendo. This one kind of leaked early due to Nintendo's survey question asking how much would you be willing to pay for a brand new WarioWare game. And Nintendo announced WarioWare, get it together, comes out on September 10th. Pre-orders are open right now in the Nintendo eShop. What did you think about this brand new WarioWare game? I love it. Uh, I I don't think there's a bad (laughs) WarioWare game. And, you know, seeing it on the Switch I'm pretty excited for it. I, I love the series, you know, and I think the Switch was made for a WarioWare game, and I'm, I'm happy to see it, it get announced at, at the Direct. Yeah, I was really glad to see a brand new WarioWare game. Um, I'm curious as to how really playing it is going to feel because it seems as though the new gimmick of this game is that you can play as different characters to complete the mic- the micro games. So you yeah. can be Wario, and he controls one way, whereas Ashley will control a different way. And, you know, it creates a lot of variety. I'm hoping there is a substantial amount of micro games and the replay value isn't limited to just playing as different characters. But I'm definitely looking forward to this release. And I'm hopeful for it because, as you mentioned, there really hasn't been a bad WarioWare game. It's been many years since we've seen a new WarioWare game. But this one looks as though they have crafted some ingenious and inventive micro games. So I'm excited to get my hands on it later this summer. We then had a, another look at Ubisoft's upcoming Switch exclusive, Mario plus Rabbids, Spark of Hope. And this title is Mario Galaxy themed. It has a Rosalina Rabbid as well as Luma. You go to different planets across the galaxy searching for the Sparks of Hope. I think the game looks absolutely fantastic based on the gameplay that they had demonstrated at the Ubisoft Forward event and in the Direct itself. It's only dated for 2022 right now, but this is definitely a game I'm looking forward to next yep, year. Absolutely. I am uh, I love Mario Rabbids, the original, and we talked about this at the, at the last um, show. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I'm all about the sequel. It looks fantastic. I can't wait to play it. We then had a long-awaited update on Atlas's upcoming Switch, Switch exclusive, Shin Megami Tensei. Five. Now, this is a franchise that is it's a bit neat. Yep. You either have interest in it or you don't. I don't think this is going to necessarily lure newcomers, despite it having a brand new gameplay approach. This is a full-on 3D Shin Megami Tensei title. Previous ones were 2D. They were on, we had Shin Megami Tensei 4 was on the 3DS. Really good game. Um, any interest in this particular title? It's not really my cup of tea. Uh, I'm not a big Shin Megami Tensei fan, but I do know that there are a lot of fans out there that listen to this show that are probably very excited that this game is finally coming out in November. Um, it looks good. You know, um, 
And I think, you know, if you're a fan of that that series, you're going to be in for a treat. So, you know, um, thumbs yeah. up for that. We're there for that for sure. I like the trailer that they had on display and how they did talk about some of the mechanics in the game. So, you know, I think it's going to be a quality release when it releases on November 12th. Definitely one of Nintendo's, I'd say, holiday pillars. Then had Advanced Wars 1 and 2 Reboot Camp. We discussed this earlier about the visual style. It comes out on December 3rd. There is a bit of concerning information that has come to my attention since we started this recording. But in the press release, Nintendo specifies that the pre-orders start today in Nintendo eShop. And that the press kit that I have just looked through does not have box art. Ooh. And so it's raising concerns that this only? may be digital only. Interesting. Interesting. Um, well... I hope that's not the case. Do I need to talk to Limited Run Games to make this yes, happen? Yes, you do. Make it happen. Make it happen, MVG. You heard it here first. <laughs> no, LRG. That, that, that'll be interesting forward. to see if it's only digital. Um, you know, maybe they're just they're they're going to see how pre-orders go before maybe you know committing to physical. Um, but hopefully they they mm-hmm. do the right thing and get get us a physical of that game because that that would be awesome. Yeah, digital only would be that would just that would be a disappointment. Yeah. We then had the Game & Watch for The Legend of Zelda. We talked about that. It has the digital clock. It includes The Legend of Zelda, Zelda 2, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, and the Game & Watch classic Vermin, starring Link as a playable character. It will be available on November 12th at the suggested retail price of $49.99. Then had Mario Party Superstars. It comes out on October 29th, and it's a collection of Five classic boards from the N64 era and what a did, collection of a hundred mini games. What did you think about this one? I I, I was surprised. What are your thoughts or takeaway of this one? See, I didn't play Mario Party, Super Mario Party, when it came out a couple of years ago because it just felt it didn't have online a meaningful online multiplayer at the time, so it was an easy pass. This it actually it looks really good the visuals look good the mini games look fun the boards you know they're classic boards at the same time i was kind of surprised that they're remaking this style of mario party again we saw this happen on the 3ds where they had a mario party superstars style collection game so that was a little surprising to see them remake the mario party series again but Having a brand new Mario Party available this holiday isn't all that surprising. Super Mario Party sold so well, and you know, it has been a couple of years, and I think this title has great selling potential. I may look into this one for a pickup. It'd be fun to play with some friends online, though. You know, the appeal of a Mario Party game is always to be, yeah, you know, in person on couch, on couch co-op. Yep. But I think this looks like a really good Mario Party, and I think it will help people understand why Mario Party was so popular during the N64 and GameCube era. We then got another look at Monster Hunter Stories 2, Wings of Ruin. There will be a demo out on June 25th, and it will carry over save data to the full game when that launches on July 9th. We saw this at the Capcom event the other day, so this was just a quick re i guess reintroduction to monster hunter stories 2 we then finally had confirmation not sure why it took this long of life is strange remastered and life is strange true colors coming to the nintendo switch later this year life is strange true colors will be available on switch on september 10th that is the same day as the playstation xbox and pc version we don't have a specific release date regarding life is strange remastered collection but that will be available later this year. I am a big fan of the Life is Strange series, and I look forward to revisiting Life is Strange 1 and Before the Storm on the Switch. And now I have to make the very difficult decision of, do I pick up Life is Strange True Colors on Switch, or do I continue my progress on the Xbox, which I that's just where I've played the previous entries and 1000 gamer scored them (laughs) but depending on the performance of the switch version that may be the platform i choose it's just something about having a life is strange game in portable form that sounds appealing to me yeah we then had a 
delightful surprise. Two of my favorite games from when I was a young lad. Super Monkey Ball, but Banana Mania was announced for the Nintendo Switch, also coming to PlayStation and Xbox platforms. On October 5th, it includes remasters of Super Monkey Ball 1, 2, and Super Monkey Ball Deluxe. Super Monkey Ball Deluxe was available on the PlayStation 2 and included content of the aforementioned two Super Monkey Ball games. I'm excited for this release. Same. Yeah, this was another one. I mean, this one kind of got spoiled a little bit because it kind of got leaked um, in recent yes. days. So we, we were kind of expecting it, um, but it's still great to see. Man, I love Super Monkey Ball. And imagine playing it on the Switch with gyro controls. I mean, come on. Ooh. If there's any system that, that Monkey Ball was <laughs> was meant for, it's it's the Switch. So please, please yes. give it to me now. I, I can't wait for Monkey Ball. Yeah, Super Monkey Ball 1 and 2 were just fantastic GameCube games. Super Monkey Target is one of the greatest oh, mini games. Absolutely, yeah. Ever. <laughs> and... I, I can't wait to revisit that original Monkey Ball game. I hope the physics remain intact as they were in the original re release. I hope Sega doesn't, you know, finick around with them in any way because those first two games have tons of challenge because there were no there were no barriers to prevent you from falling off the stage. This was pinpoint precision. Yeah, and I cannot wait. To revisit those two games again so i'm looking forward to that release it was nice to see ai and gong gong all make a glorious return so let's go sega you have my attention we then had dagon ropa s ultimate summer camp announced for switch along with dagon ropa decadence which is a physical collection consisting of many dagon ropa games this is a first for the franchise to come to the Nintendo Switch. These were quite popular on the PlayStation Vita. And I guess we can finally say the Switch is the true successor to PlayStation Vita now. Absolutely. <laughs> then had a new look at Mario Golf Super Rush with a new Donk City course. What do you, think, game or what do you think about this game? Because I, I got to be honest, Nate. I mean, I love Mario Golf and I, I love the, the, the Game Boy Color game and everything, but... <laughs> Uh, this game wasn't really grabbing me in in the same fashion as the older games, but I will oh. say it's starting to grow on me now. What are your thoughts? I love golf games in general, but this is one of those titles I want them to have like an an open play beta. Yeah. So I can test out some of the golfing mechanics, get familiar with how the game is going to play, control, and you know, just get an idea because the single player mode is definitely what has my attention and I need to know that it's going to be substantial. I don't want it to just to be a cookie cutter golf RPG where it's like, oh yeah, you got some stats from, you know, just driving and putting. I need a little more meat to it. And if they can give me that, then the game's going to have my undivided attention. I would probably consider picking it up at launch. So this is something I still need to know a little more about. I was kind of surprised they didn't go into a little more detail in this direct on the title, considering it is out in just over two weeks. But, you know, maybe I'll wait for reviews on it. But I like what I'm seeing in terms of, you know, the visual approach, the variety in terms of course design. So there's definitely a lot to appreciate and love here. I'm just going to be a little more hesitant until I get full details on the game modes. We then had another look at The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD. comes out on July 16th. What's your... Had, um, what, how do you feel about Skyward Sword? Because I, I never really liked the original. Are you going to give this one a go? No. In a word, no. I, I played through it on the Wii. I enjoyed my time with it. It's the only Zelda game I have never replayed. I didn't enjoy my time with it enough to revisit. And... As of now, we still are not yeah. aware of any quality of life improvements beyond traditional controls. And that's just not enough for me to revisit this game. Yeah. At least not at full price. Yeah. You know, maybe in a year if it gets discounted or if I can find it used for a little, you know, a little cheaper, I'll consider it. But right now, I really don't have that much interest in Skyward Sword HD. If you've never played Skyward Sword HD, this is 
you know, probably the version to play, but they just haven't sold me on it yet. We then had a quick recap of some of the upcoming third party games, which include Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, Just Dance 2022, Two Point Campus, Worms, Rumble. And we got confirmation that Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy is coming to Switch, and it's coming to the Switch in the form of a cloud version. It will be available on October 26th. Man, and this was a surprise. Yeah, th this was a surprise. I didn't mean to, <laughs> yeah. didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no. What? A yeah, Square Enix, what, what's going on with them right now? Like, what is happening over there? Confusion. I mean... I... I wish I knew what was going on at Square Enix right now, because when they showed Guardians of the Galaxy at their own showcase for 20 minutes, <laughs> yeah, um, the game's not visually so impressive that at any point I was looking at saying, oh, this can't come to Switch. And then they didn't announce it for the Switch at the showcase. They announced it at the Direct as a cloud game. It's kind of like, okay, like you, you're coming to the platform neat, but... I man, Square, Square had a rough E3. Yeah, no doubt. They they really had a rough E3. I mean, we'll probably deep dive that into a full E3 recap early next week because it's definitely a lot to dissect with Microsoft, Square, Ubisoft, Namco, and such. But yeah, our thoughts on Square will come come next week because there's a lot to go over with them. <laughs> Then we had Fatal Frame, Maiden of Black Water. It's coming to Switch, all PlayStation platforms, and Xbox platforms, and Steam later this year. This was previously a Wii U exclusive, mm -hmm. and it was digital only in North America. I believe it had a physical release in Japan and Europe, but this is a really, really good Fatal Frame. The way they handled the release on the Wii U was odd to say the least it was episodic yeah and it never really had a chance to shine one because it was on the wii u and because it was digital only in the west but now it's multi-platform and i hope the game is able to find an audience because it's a it's actually pretty spooky it's a great game probably one of the best and most underrated games on the wii u which um a lot of people either slept on or they didn't even know about existed because it you're right it was never really marketed very well in north america it got the physical release in japan i believe in europe as well um but i'm i'm glad it's coming you know to to um the switch but i will tell you that this kind of game i'm probably going to pick up on the playstation instead rather than the switch because this is a game that you want to play on a big screen tv with 4k and 60 frames per second and now we may get 60 fps on the the switch port but we may not so this is the kind of game where you want to you want the visuals to be as best as they can be so you're either going to dip on the xbox uh series x version or the playstation 5 version yeah i mean i wouldn't mind playing it on the switch in handheld mode if it has you know gyro functionality mm -hmm. but at the same time you're right i think i would prefer it on the series x or the playstation 5 especially if it has you know full 4k functionality and you know the textures and everything are just superior to what we're getting on the switch but in general i think it was a pretty exciting release definitely out of nowhere yeah caught a lot of people by surprise to see that fatal frame is coming back even if it is just a port of the wii u game and i know some people may be confused because nintendo had an invested stake in the Fatal Frame franchise, which is why it was exclusive on the Wii and the Wii U for so many years. And this might be one of those rare cases where Nintendo was willing to separate themselves from this particular release, but any new Fatal Frame moving forward, Nintendo may still be able to have exclusive rights to. We don't have all those specifics as to what happened here. This could be similar to what we saw with the Wonderful 101, though. Mm -hmm. Right. But hopefully this leads to brand new Fatal Frame game because we haven't had these style games in quite a long time. And if you like Pokemon Snap, it's the same general concept, except you're being chased and haunted and terrified by ghosts and spirits and you get to photograph them. And it's slightly more disturbing than Pokemon Snap. But 
maybe Pokemon Snap will raise your interest levels in the brand new Fatal Frame. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. We. <laughs> And another surprise announcement, though this did kind of leak, I believe the game was rated in Australia. Thanks, Australia Ratings Board. Hey. With Cruisin' Blast. I like this announcement. I mean, I'm probably like <laughs> one of 10 people that like this announcement, but I love <laughs> the Cruising USA series, which did start its life on the N64. And, yes. and someone's going to correct me, I'm sure, but I don't believe... There was ever a cruising game that was not on a Nintendo system. Um, that may be inaccurate. Um, it may, you know, Cruising World or something may have ended up on a collection somewhere else. But um, I, uh, I'm, I'm all about this one, Cruising Blast. It looks colorful. It looks arcade-ish. Mm -hmm. And the Switch could use yes. more arcade races. I'm, I'm all about it. Yeah, I think the cruising games have only been on arcades yep. beyond, you know, as far as not including Nintendo hardware and to see a new cruising game come to the switch is definitely exciting. But as you said, you know, there's probably only 10 people out there who are really <laughs> excited about this because they don't, they don't know what the cruising franchise is all about. That's true because it's, it's been so many years, but if this game is priced appropriately, this yeah. is definitely something I could see myself downloading from the eShop and just having a lot of fun going through all those courses and that classic arcade racing style. So, you know, bring it on. It's coming out this fall. Give me a fair price and I will be interested. The Doom Eternal DLC, Ancient Gods, is available on Switch today. We then had the announcement that Dragon Ball Z Kakarot and a new Power Awakens set will come to Switch on September 24th. Now, this game came out on Xbox and PlayStation in January of 2020. So this is a late port, which is the style when it comes to Dragon Ball Z games and the Switch. We then had Strange Brigade, which is available on the Switch today, and Astria Ascending, which will be available on September 30th. So all in all, a diverse direct in terms of software shown. And Nintendo did have a handful of new announcements for fans with Metroid Dread, WarioWare, and advanced wars and i want to go back to the topic of zelda really quick to wrap up this discussion i mean we touched on it a lot in the first half of this where the 35th anniversary feels slightly underwhelming mm -hmm. but breath of the wild 2 as we said you know that 2022 release date and the idea that it could even slide to 2023 is definitely it's definitely a concern I would have as a fan. And, you know, in the moment, I'm happy that we got the update. I'm happy with the new trailer. We can now look at it. We can dissect it. We can analyze it, try to find clues and, you know, all of that. Oh, I actually forgot something. A brand new Smash Brothers character. <laughs> Kazuya. I forgot all about him. That was uh, that was a <laughs> that, I, I like that um, opening. Because I like Tekken anyway, um, and that was a, another left field pick from uh, Sakurai that no, I don't think any of us saw coming. So I, I thought I thought the trailer was was funny how he just kept um, yeah. you know tossing his <laughs> opponents over the cliff and everything, and then the Kirby thing was funny. Uh, I thought it was I thought it was a good opening to the show, and I think he's a good character, you know, in Smash. Definitely a surprising addition. I don't think if you put a list of 20 characters, anyone was going to put a Tekken fighter as their number one choice. But that's the, I mean, that's, that's the appeal of Smash Brothers. It's that it's a celebration of the industry and Tekken is an iconic fighting franchise. It is an iconic franchise. You know, it's an iconic series for gaming as a whole. And maybe... This means Harada is planning or hopes to bring a Tekken game to the Switch. We know that he had expressed some interest in potentially bringing Tekken 7 to the platform, but he wasn't sure if the hardware could handle the game. So maybe this is that glimmer of hope that Tekken will find its way to Switch. It was on the Wii U. We had Tekken Tag Tournament 2 on the Wii U, 
And it's actually a pretty fun game. No one bought it because it was the Wii U. <laughs> I did. And <laughs> you and maybe one other person. <laughs> but now we have one more fighter left for Smash Brothers. And is there really any chance that the finale of the Smash Brothers fighter pack ends on a high note? Oh, I don't I don't know how this is going to play out. I kind of wish they'd announce two characters in this direct just to kind of finish it off, but I'm sure this has already been planned and and scripted probably for the last year or so at Nintendo and um and uh and at Sora. So I mean, I feel like whatever's going to come, I feel like it's going to be a big thing, right? I mean, I don't think it's just going to be a small announcement of a character that none of us had had considered uh, i think it's going to be a pretty hype one but who knows i mean you know who knows how this is going to play out but yeah i mean what, what are your thoughts on the finale of of smash characters do you think this is it or do you think maybe they'll they're, they're like well we're going to add two more you know after this you know because i mean there's no guarantees that this this is it right i mean <laughs> i think it is but you know things always change yeah, I think it's it. This this is the final fighters pack. We have one more character, and that's going to be it. Mm-hmm. Sakurai's kind of expressed that this he's done after this. Yeah, and I'm sure he's ready to move on from Smash Brothers at this point. But as far as what they could end with, I mean, you have to end with a substantial announcement, especially when you look at some of the characters that have been in the fighters pass. I mean, Sephiroth, Steve from Minecraft. Yeah. You have these iconic third-party characters, and now you go with a Tekken fighter. And now, you know, Nintendo has to feel some pressure of this is the final one. Even though the pressure probably shouldn't exist. Yeah. There shouldn't be any expectation just because it is the finale of the Fighters Pass and DLC for Smash Brothers Ultimate. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be some megaton character reveal. Right. Like it doesn't have to be like Master Chief. It could it could still just be a nice, simple Nintendo character. And, you know, the reactions are going to be like, oh, how could you end it on that? It has to end. And I don't think there's really an outcome where anyone's happy with the way this ends. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I think there's <laughs> going to be some, some outrage in some pockets of the Smash you know, fan base that doesn't like how it ends, but it has to end, right? I mean, it, it, there's an end date right. here. There's a, you know, so something's going to have to give here, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm curious to see really how they end it because I definitely wouldn't have expected attacking character at this point. But now when you look at it, we have repre- we have fighter representation from Street Fighter, yep. Tekken, and King of Fighters. Yeah, that's pretty. that's pretty awesome. That's really cool when you really take a step back and look at that type of representation in a single fighting game from Nintendo to have that type of spread. So, you know, I'm ready to see what that last character is going to be. I'm hoping for a big surprise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if they come out and they just say it's Birdo (laughs) from the Mario franchise, I'd have a good laugh and be like, hey, I'm okay with that. (laughs) And we'll end with, what was your overall grade for the Nintendo Direct and why did you give it that grade? Well, I'm going to give you my grade, but you said you you had a, a quick thing about Zelda, so I want to I want to touch um, on that again. Yeah. So why don't you uh, let us know what you were thinking there? I'm thinking of just how, like, where did they go forward with just Zelda communication on this as, like, a whole because if this is really their plans for the remainder of the 35th, it means we're not getting anything substantial moving forward. Yeah. We're not going to get, you know, we'll probably have a September or an early fall direct. We're not going to get another update on Breath of the Wild 2 with that. Right. We're not going to get any other Zelda 35th update at that type of event. And it just feels, I mean, it goes back to like the original point that we had earlier it just kind of feels as though they could have done something a little more meaningful to really just make it feel like that 35th celebration. Yeah. And it's kind of goes back to like what we were saying with Mario 35th. 
it just doesn't feel like an anniversary party. It just feels like here's a badge. It says 35th anniversary. Yep. Right. It just feels empty, feels hollow. Yeah. And I think that's just disappointing that that's how some of these, you know, if the anniversary is really just a marketing ploy to get sales, I understand it. Kudos to them for not releasing a time limited collection again, like 3D All Stars. We're not being forced or being tricked into purchasing a product that's only available for six months or less. So, I mean, that's nice to see, but it just, the whole 35th anniversary just feels a little, it just feels lackluster. Yeah. And today just really highlighted that. Yeah. I, I do agree with you. I mean, after Mario's 35th, um, you do, you know, you kind of came into this thinking they're going to make this one better. Um, and honestly, at least right now, as of the end of E3, it seems like things have regressed for them, you know, um, again, probably COVID related, probably things beyond their control, but you do wonder, you know, if, if this is really it for the 35th, um, maybe we'll see more, but you know, don't, don't expect anything, I guess, based on Anumasan's words, you know, I think anything we get between now and then is kind of a bonus, you know? Um, so I, I, I do agree that it, it was lackluster and, um, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I, I think Nintendo could have done a lot better here, you know? Yeah. I mean, it really feels as though there is no 35th anniversary plan. Yep. It, it's just, Hey, we have to acknowledge this in some way. Here's the game and watch. That's all we have. Yep. Bye. And you know, it's, it's also one of those cases where it's, how can we complain? We don't have to get anything. Right. So that's, I mean, that's, it just, I think just as a fan, it just kind of like, oh, yeah. when we've seen the 25th and the 30th anniversary and you do something and you start prepping up for this 35th and it's just nothing. Yeah. You just can't feel, you know, you just can't help but feel a little, a little disappointed in that. And I know there's a lot of other Zelda fans out there that I've talked to who are kind of they're feeling the same way of, wow, there's, there was really nothing meaningful for Zelda's 35th. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're just taken aback by it right? and surprised by it. But as we mentioned, it could be due to COVID. It could be external factors. Yep. And, you know, that's okay. Yep. We still have, you know, you still have Skyward Sword coming out this year. We still have, you have the game of watch. We got a new look at Breath of the Wild 2. So there's still enough to be excited about if you are a Zelda fan. But, I mean, I don't blame anyone if they do feel a little disappointed that we're not seeing Wind Waker HD with Twilight Princess HD this year or before the fiscal year concludes because I'm right there with you. So yes, your grade and why. Okay, so I really like the Direct. I know that there was some some issues with it. Um, Zelda was probably the biggest thing for me, um, but I'm willing to give them a pass, especially considering everything we just talked about probably external factors beyond their control. What I really liked about the show was there were a lot of surprises. There were a lot of games. And most importantly, the thing that made me believe that Nintendo's show was better than Xbox was that they have games coming out this year. Xbox was a fantastic show. And I know we haven't talked about it yet. We will um, probably next week. But Xbox's show was great. But a lot of the games for Xbox were coming out 2022 and beyond. And I really loved what Xbox had for us. I was very hyped at the show, but I felt Nintendo was the best show because they had enough surprises for me and enough games coming out this year for me to say, well, that is a true E3 2021 showcase, not a um, a look at at the future, if that makes sense. So... For me, even with Zelda's 35th um, lacking, I'll say we did set we did get Breath of the Wild 2 info. We did get 2022 on the end of it, even though that's probably a soft, soft date at this point. We got Advance Wars, we got Mario Party, we got WarioWare, we got Super Monkey Ball, Metroid. Um, 
for me, that is enough to say uh, I, I thought it was the best show. As far as a grade, I'm going to give it a solid, well, are we giving it out of 10 or a, a, a letter? What was the? Uh, let's <laughs> do out of 10. Out of 10, out of 10. <laughs> I'm going to give it a nine. I thought it was really good. I thought it was really good. It could have been better. No, no question about it. Um, I was was quite happy with what with what Nintendo showed us. I I came into it with fairly low expectations, and they surprised me. And I was I was pretty happy with it. Okay, I think I'm going to come in with a solid eight out of ten. I think it it delivered in what it had to do. Overall, I would say it feels like a it felt like a safe Nintendo Direct. Mm-hmm. There really wasn't that moment of a whoa, but what you saw is a lot of uh, this is good. Yeah, this is good. Nice. And that's why I come in at that eight. Metroid Dread looks fantastic. WarioWare looks a lot of fun. Advance Wars was a nice surprise. The Breath of the Wild 2 trailer looks fantastic. We now know it's dated for 2022, but as you mentioned, it's probably a very fluid release date. Yeah. And third party variety was pleasant. We had the other look, you know, another look at Mario Rabbids 2, and that looks like a phenomenal game. Having the Life is Strange games finally get confirmed for the platform was nice. You have some late ports with like Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. It felt like it was a it was a nice direct. It was a tight package. It was well paced. We have the Smash DLC with Tekken. There was a lot on display. My biggest detractor from it was really, if you're not a hardcore Nintendo fan, so if you're just more of the casual Nintendo fan, you probably walked away from this direct saying, there's nothing there for me. And that's fine. Not every presentation is going to appeal to you. And a lot of the games on display from the Nintendo were from there, and it pains me to say, they're mid-tier franchises. Metroid doesn't have that mass appeal. WarioWare certainly doesn't either nor does advanced wars this is a franchise that has been missing since battalion wars on the wii which did not sell particularly well never mind battalion wars on the gamecube but those are different style games so we haven't had an advanced wars in this style since the ds and that game sold atrociously so it's another niche franchise for me all those franchises appeal to me so this was a very good direct in that regard I can't wait to play all those titles. But for that Nintendo fan who wanted to see something big, they wanted something bigger than just a Breath of the Wild 2 trailer. I could see them walking away from this and just saying, man, that was really disappointing. And I think it comes back to the COVID situation. Nintendo has other games in development, be it a Kirby game. This is something the Kirby team has actively tweeted on, that they have ambitions, great ambitions for their next title. Why wasn't that at E3? Simple. Their focus was on 2021, and they gave us a few looks at 2022 games. But otherwise, everything Nintendo dated for themselves, Breath of the Wild 2 aside, is coming out before the end of this calendar year. So this may have not been the best venue to reveal a brand new Kirby game. The Donkey Kong game that has long been rumored in development, likely another 2022 release. This wasn't the proper time to unveil that game. Or even a new Xenoblade project or a new Fire Emblem. These were games, or Bayonetta 3. I know a lot of people are disappointed we haven't heard and seen Bayonetta 3 in quite some time. But due to their focus and the time slot that they gave their E3 Direct, certain things just were never going to appear here. Now, when we have a direct come September or October later this year, those type of titles can make an appearance or Nintendo may hold them until early next year when they want to begin to flesh out that 2022 lineup. So in a vacuum, I think the E3 direct is exactly what Nintendo needed to be. They fleshed out that holiday and H2 of 2021 lineup really well. A lot of great software diversity. Can't wait to play 2D Metroid. If you are just that Nintendo fan looking for something more, something, that hype moment, this Direct wasn't for you, which is fine. But that's why I come in at a solid 8 out of 10. Yep, well said. Now we can go into some of the Streamlab questions for the week. And some of these do predate E3, so we have to keep that in mind. 
But we had a $5 donation from Madanume, who writes last minute E3 Smash Brothers predictions. Gonna go with Ryu Hayabusa and Crash Bandicoot if it's a dual reveal. I'm confident that there will be a couple of fighters left past Fighter Pack 2. Not much, yet this game seems to do very well as cross promotion for Nintendo. Well, <laughs> we didn't get either of those. <laughs> Maybe next time. Then Madanume followed up with another $5 donation and wrote last minute Nintendo left field game predictions. Let's go with a new Diddy Kong racing adventure similar to Mario Kart, but different enough and enough of a legacy that will attract nostalgia and new fans alike. That would have been nice. Maybe next time. <laughs> we then had a dollar donation from Jingo Jonas. Right, with the Switch Pro coming eventually and the possibility of the OG Switch being phased out slowly, could we see some of the exclusive third-party games for the Pro getting cloud versions for those not ready to make the jump or cloud versions getting native ports? Yes, I believe we could. It would definitely be you know, a game-to-game -game basis and depending on what the publisher is looking to do because some of the cloud games that we see on the Switch are based just on the PC versions. So if they don't have an actual cloud version in development or being prototyped, they may not want to allocate such development resources to do that. But it would be a game-by-game -game basis, but you certainly can't dismiss the possibility. We then had a dollar donation from Jackie G. Who writes, hello, gentlemen. Which Final Fantasy would you say, in terms of the divisiveness, is the Mario Sunshine of the series? Eight or 12? Oh, I'd say eight. But 12 is a good pick, too. I, I would go with eight. I would go with eight because I think 12 has kind of been redeemed in the eyes of people over the years. Eight as a follow up to seven is just a weird game. You go to space, you fight aliens. Eight is kind of just nonsense. But I don't hate eight either. Then I had a dollar donation from Kiga, who writes Why don't companies charge less for digital games, specifically first party titles like from Sony? Physical copies cost to press ship and retailers get a cut. $10 off digital games would lock more people into the into their digital ecosystem. Long-term gains. The simple reason is that retailers would basically threaten not to stock the physical copy if a console manufacturer or a publisher is selling it for significantly less digitally. So the pricing structure is set up that retailers don't feel as though they are at a disadvantage. But that's why you see companies like Sony and other third parties and even Nintendo do the digital deluxe versions for you get extra content for an additional 10 or $20 if you go digital only. We then had a dollar donation from Sony Pony Killer for 2069. <laughs> Can't believe you're still pushing your PlayStation agenda. Don't forget, Nate lied about the Switch Pro releasing in 2014. You should love my favorite box. P.S. 2014. Yeah, P.S. That generally hurt to type. It's a me, Jackie G. <laughs> Always enjoy the content you produce. <laughs> well done, Jackie G. <laughs> you had us at the start. We then had a $3 donation from Just In Time. Right, hello, gentlemen. Back in the PlayStation 3 days, Insomniac released 10 games for the system, two of which being budget titles. Now a first-party studio and two games already out. Do you think Insomniac will somehow meet or exceed that number in PlayStation 5 releases? Love you guys. 10 games is a lot. It is. That's a, that's a hell of a lot. But as you mentioned, they already, I mean, if we want to really be technical, we could say they're three games deep. They have Miles Morales, they have the Spider-Man remaster, and now they have Ratchet and Clank of Rift Apart on PlayStation 5. Um, we'll probably have Spider-Man 2, I'd say, next year. So, I mean, they'd almost be they're 40 percent of the way there, potentially. Depends how long this generation goes. We have to remember the PlayStation 3 generation was abnormally long. But if they do some of those smaller digital games, you know, like a Ratchet and Clank spinoff, 
type of thing. Yeah. I could see them come close to 10. We then had a dollar donation from Big Mac. Right. Why have we not seen Rockstar make another Smuggler's Run game? Or port an old one to modern consoles if the original sold so well that it made it to the greatest hits library? Because Rockstar is focused on Grand Theft Auto Online, their big money maker. And I think the last Smuggler's Run game was on the GameCube. Maybe the Wii. I think the Wii may have had one. Yeah. And that's just a tough game to sell in the modern market, but I would be open f- to see them return to it. And then we had a $3 donation from Alan. Based on the Zelda game, oh, based on the Zelda game and watch and what Onuma said, the only Zelda title coming to the Switch is Skyward Sword. Is that your understanding? For the anniversary, yes. Yep. That is my understanding. I'm sure when you listen to this show, you'll you'll get the full scoop of our thoughts. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes today's episode of Nate the Hate discussing Nintendo's E3 Direct. We will have a, another episode up early next week going over E3 as a whole, give our recap on all the press conferences that took place, including Ubisoft, Square Enix, Microsoft, and probably have a bit of Nintendo, but that will be an overview as a whole, not a reaction like this episode was. And if you'd like to support the show, we have a Streamlabs link in our description below. Make a donation of any amount, ask a question. We will answer it at the end of the episode. Donate $100 or more. We will dedicate the episode to you. And I'd like to thank my co-host, MVG, for joining me as always. Thanks for having me on, night. Always a pleasure. And until next time... Continue to embrace the hate.